Uh, well, let's go ahead and, and uh, get started. Um, I want to thank you again for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, for those of you who have not uh, met me, I am Gerald Hale, Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. I would also like to introduce the other panelists to you. And uh, when I do introduce you, uh, please, uh, our panelists, unmute yourself and, and uh, say hello to all the people who have joined us. Uh, the first uh, person I'd like to introduce is uh, Mr. Tom Ellis, the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Operations. And uh, Mr. Brett Fuchs, Associate Dean of Students. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, Ms. Mary Marr, the Senior Instructional Developer in the Walker Center for Teaching and Learning. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Matt Matthews, Interim Vice Provost. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Tony Parsley, Associate CIO. Hello, everyone. Ms. Lori Pugh, the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Human Resources. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. And Dr. Chris Smith, uh, the Chief Health uh, Affairs Officer for the University. Good afternoon. Um, I, I can't see everybody's face. Did I miss any panelists? If so, uh, please forgive me and also uh, uh, let people know that you're here. And then uh, finally, I want to introduce uh, our uh, moderator uh, to you, um, who will be helping us with the, the webinar this afternoon. Um, she is uh, Susan Lazenby from the uh, IT team on campus. And uh, Susan and I are getting to be old hands um, at these webinars. Susan, thank you very much for your assistance today. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. We, we have organized the, uh, the webinar today around a, a series of issues and a series of questions that we think will be important for you all as you uh, uh, begin your face-to-face -face teaching um, for fall 2020, which will be very different than face-to-face -face teaching in many ways that you have done in the past. And we wanted to, to go through the information with you so that you would have it at your uh, disposal. And uh, Dr. Matthews has put a slide up on the screen uh, that I trust you all can see um, to introduce the, the first of the issues. Um, it is, uh, what's the process UTC follows when a student in my class tests positive for COVID-19, is symptomatic for COVID-19, or is, it is exposed uh, to COVID-19? And I think we'll have two of our panelists uh, uh, Dr. Smith and, uh, and um, uh, Associate Dean Fuchs, uh, who will be uh, sharing some information on that particular uh, question. So when this happens, it's a very um, involved process that is based on evidence. What we do is as um, we do it through a process that is tried and true. Contact tracing has been around for other concerns. And what we are doing is we are following the guidelines that the Chattanooga Hamilton County Health Department has put in place. So I will let Mr. Fuchs start and I'll fill in with any other information. Sure, absolutely, Dr. Smith. Um, so the process flows uh, kind of like this. We receive the information either through the notification form which is currently the same notification form that faculty and staff fill out. So if any of you have done so uh, because you've had COVID symptoms, uh, you've been COVID positive potentially, or had some type of exposure, the students fill out that same form. Uh, once that form is filled out, or we learn of the issue in some other way, whether that's through the health department, which receives reports from uh, independent uh, doctor's offices and, and, and other practitioners in the community, um, or through some other means, um, the UTC contact tracing team takes that case in conjunction with the health department and conducts a case interview to determine whether that person um, is positive potentially, whether that person needs to go into isolation or quarantine, as well as identify any close contacts, so individuals who may have been exposed. Once that information is gathered, for students at least, the next step is it's turned over in part to the student outreach and support team 
where we begin monitoring the students' daily uh, symptoms. So we check on their physical health, their mental health. We check on academic concerns, housing-related concerns, uh, if they're living on campus, uh, if they were receiving appropriate food services, um, and, and such. Uh, so we do that on a daily basis. We actually have folks doing that just down the hall from me right now with all of the students who are currently in isolation or quarantine. And we do that whether they're on or off campus and whether they're, uh, whether they're in Chattanooga or not. In addition to that, academic notifications are sent out to each student's faculty member, um, alerting them to the student's status. So those letters are intentionally a little bit vague. It doesn't tell you whether the student is in isolation or quarantine. It tells you the length of time that they are in uh, because faculty members certainly have a need to know, uh, but don't need to know the student's specifics per se. Um, so that does go out and a number of you have likely received those letters because all of the students who will be in isolation or quarantine past Sunday night um, you are receiving letters for those students as we speak. They're going out one by one and make sure that all faculty members are notified and alert to that. So it's very important that you open those letters. They come from our database system, Maxient. Um, they come to you in a PDF format. Um, so they're able to maintain or keep those letters if you want to. Housing will also then relocate any of the students who live on campus into an isolation or quarantine space. Um, so some of the spaces are here on campus. Some of them are a local hotel that we're using, as Dr. Smith uh, talked about in previous uh, Chancellor's Q&As. Um, and once we do that, we make sure that all their needs are met through housing as well. So housing checks on them to make sure, again, that they're getting food service right to their room, that their laundry is getting met. Uh, we'll deliver any uh, additional things like medicines to their room if they need it. Um, if they need books from the library, we'll will facilitate that process as well, as well as getting them outside to get some exercise. So um, as to keep them away from other people so others aren't exposed, but to make sure they get taken care of. Dr. Smith, anything else to add to that? Yeah, it's kind of like being in a full service uh, spa. They bring you your meals and they make sure you have exercise and they take care of your laundry. So it sounds kind of nice. Uh, one thing that I do want to interject very briefly is um, let's talk about what, you know, this, this particular um, instance of a positive student in, in your class, what happens. As Brett said, we, um, once we get the, the concern that there may be a positive or someone who has been exposed and they have been in a space, let's just say a classroom for this, for this um, conversation, um, there's always concern from faculty and even staff members. Um, how, are you gonna tell me who that is? Uh, I have, I, I really think I need to know if there's been a positive person in my, in my class, I need to know. Well, in a way, um, you don't need to really have great concern about that because the contact tracing team is going to interview that individual and they're going to determine if they um, were close to you for more than 10 minutes with less than six feet, if they really put the people around them at risk. So that's why we've been pretty, um, adamant about you all understanding where people are sitting in your classroom. For example, I'm sitting on in row one on seat number one. Chris Smith is there, you know, on Monday. And then Brett is sitting on row four over on the left hand side, probably 45 to 50 feet away from me. And I'm positive. Brett does not need to be concerned, but Mary, who is sitting next to me, and then um, say, Tony, who's sitting right behind me, because we know where people are seated, uh, the contact tracers will talk to them and say, okay, so let's talk about this. We are concerned that you might have been cl in close contact with someone in the classroom. They'll do a lot of really in-depth conversations and they'll determine, well, no, Mary and Tony were not at risk because Chris was only there for, um, to pick up some papers and move out or maybe they were because Chris was sitting there and she was coughing and sneezing all over the place. She didn't have her mask on. She wasn't washing her, washing her hands and she was basically up in my face. So then you would be identified as a close contact. Um, will we notify the entire class? No, we'll only notify those people who, who need to understand. Um, so I think the issue here is we all need to trust the system. And if we do need to let you know that you're at risk, we certainly will do so. We will not hide anything from anybody. So if you um, remember, and I've used the exa example a couple of times, when we're talking about um, uh, Amigos in East Ridge a couple of weeks ago, the health department put out a, a notice that said, if you were at Amigos on July 27th, between the hours of one and four, please call us. 
And then when you call them, they will ask you a series of very specific questions and they'll say, oh no, you weren't at risk. You came in really um, and that the concern was not there. So we would parse through an entire class or an in entire um, faculty or building or whatever to really figure out who is at risk and who isn't. Because if one person in a classroom of 30 people, um, if there was real concern, we would have to quarantine 30 people and we want to keep as few people having to go into quarantine unnecessarily. So that's how that happens. Uh, there will be no broad notifications that uh, nursing 2110 on Friday, uh, August 24th uh, needs to be quarantined or isolated. It's going to be very specific. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith and Brett. I appreciate that. Um, our next question is going to be um, answered by two people as well. Um, it's about UTC's response to the COVID-19 case. So what is the process UTC follows for cleaning when a person uh, in a campus building or classroom tests positive for COVID-19 or is symptomatic for COVID-19? Um, Bob and Tom, could you answer that for us? Yeah, I see that. I think Thomas had to step off. So absolutely. So the process is um, as soon as we have a notification of a positive case or a case that uh, Dr. Smith's health team has said, hey, we need to take aggressive action and, and make sure we can clean that space. We're using resources um, right away, come in to, to fog a location and uh, make sure that, oh, pardon me, Tom actually just, just joined in. He, he came to my office. So um, Tom, the question just came out which is uh, the process for, for cleaning a, a classroom um, or an office building once we get a positive case. So hopefully our audio will pick up here. Well, I was gonna say in that situation, we're going to respond, facilities will respond at the direction of, of emergency services and safety risks. So I think Bob was probably explaining what that process was. We, we do have adequate resources to respond. Uh, however quickly as directed or required um, from emergency services and safety. And we've got uh, both resources internally as well as contractors if uh, uh, to make sure we provide all the, the locations with the adequate cleaning they need as fast as possible. Um, we're using uh, chemicals that are approved by the EPA um, for treatment of the situation. So we're using, again, we're, we're not taking any shortcuts anywhere. And we're making sure that we can, uh, once the space is safe and clean to reoccupy, then that information is passed back along to uh, the provost office as well as all the other folks who are on our, our COVID emergency team. Thank you so much, Bob and Tom. I appreciate that. Um, moving on to our next section of questions. It's about masks and social distancing. Brett, could you talk to us about the following question? How can I respond if a student in my class declines to wear a mask or socially distance? Absolutely. So there's a number of things that we recommend in this situation. Um, and some of those recommendations actually came out in some guidance yesterday uh, that we sent to all faculty. And we've been talking about this as well as uh, today in our road shows that we've been coming around doing with the different departments and hope to get to as many departments as possible. Um, for those that we haven't met yet. So we'll be following up with the departments. Um, but that said, the first thing we recommend is to remind the student in a firm yet kind manner that they really need to put the mask on. It's a health and safety reason. Um, so I would just recommend asking them to comply. Again, you're the instructor. They should understand that you're the instructor and that is your classroom. Um, so they need to respect that hopefully and hopefully that they will. Um, you know, as much as we can, we, we are wanting to remind students this isn't a political issue. This is a public health issue. Um, and there's also a policy, and again, this came out yesterday officially. Uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Richard Brown sent it out in an email to the campus community reminding folks that this policy is now in effect. It lists specifically what face masks are considered, when face masks must be worn, and that includes at all times in all instructional spaces. If the student doesn't comply, again, remind the student that there is, uh, that they're non-compliant with uh, the student code of conduct, with the COVID-19 policy, as well as the, your classroom requirements. Uh, because obviously as the course instructor, you should be enforcing those policy requirements uh, in the system. Um, if the student is not compliant, again, ask them to comply or leave the classroom immediately. At this point, you can also contact the Office of Student Conduct. Some of my team will come and respond. 
My team, especially in these first couple of weeks of the semester, will be driving around campus in our golf cart or walking around. We have dubbed the golf cart the mask mobile for the semester. We're looking for some stickers for the side of it now. We're going to put a big mask on the front of it, maybe. Um, so hopefully we can get some folks to remember that this is necessary and we will help de-escalate that. And I know some of you have attended some of the de-escalation trainings that uh, my team has also been hosting, which are talking about some of these techniques. If the student continues to fail to comply and it's escalating and it's really disruptive to the entire class, I would then consider assessing the situation and consider dismissing the class. Um, and I was just discussing this earlier with Dr. Hale. This doesn't mean that we should dismiss class every week. This means that if a student is disruptive in a particular class, um, and it causes such a disruption that you just can't keep going, um, that you really need to stop or it's causing an issue, that means we're going to dismiss that class on a particular day. And at that point, any of these situations, whether it's a minor issue or major issue, you need to report it to us, um, to the Office of Student Conduct, that is. So even if the student does comply, let us know, because if the issue happens again in the future, we're going to pull the student out of your class, or students if that's the case, and prevent them from returning to your class until we work out a plan with that student. If they haven't directly violated the code of conduct, we will talk about a behavioral agreement, which means that they need to follow that agreement saying, let's say they're not wearing the mask, that they're gonna wear the mask every time they return to your classroom. And if they don't agree to that, we're gonna move them either to an online section of the class if it's available, or we're gonna to have to talk about moving the student off campus in terms of a suspension. Again, that's gonna be the last step, hopefully, uh, but that's what we will do. I will always put out there and always want you to remember that if it becomes violent or threatening in any way, please, please, please call the UTC police. Uh, we do not want any faculty or staff member to have to physically engage with a student. That's why we have a campus police department. Our staff have radios in particular, so if they respond, we have a direct connection with the police department. Um, so again, should a situation become violent or truly threatening, engage the UTC police. There are red phones in most of our classrooms that connect right to the police department by dialing 911 or 4357. And you can also, and I always recommend for faculty members to keep your cell phone nearby, certainly on silent, not to disrupt the classroom. But if you don't have a red phone in your classroom to be able to contact the police department, should that be absolutely necessary. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, while we're on the topic of masks, uh, Lori, the next question is for you. It is about masks and social distancing also, and it's how can I respond if a UTC colleague declines to wear a mask or to socially distance? Yeah, thank you, Susan. I think this is a really great question. And I would, I would start by just reminding everyone that, you know, we've been communicating for some time now that we are all in this together. So we really want to do our best to comply with all the health and safety requirements that we've established on campus to assist us in this fall semester and through this unique situation that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, if you have a colleague on campus that is not wearing a mask, not social distancing, you know, first I would, I would encourage everyone to feel comfortable to remind your colleague of the requirements. Uh, as Brett has mentioned, we've established an interim COVID-19 policy social distancing, wearing a mask is part of that policy. So if we have those who are declining to do so, that truly can be interpreted as a policy violation. We do expect that all of our faculty and staff do their very best to meet all of our health and safety requirements this academic year. Uh, but encouraging them, sending them a friendly reminder, letting them know not to forget to socially distance, to put their mask on, I walked across campus a few times this summer and interacted with individuals and in a very friendly way said, hey, don't forget your mask. And I, I had mine on and, and, and they put it on. You know, it's a, it's a new normal, uh, it's a different experience. So I would encourage people to feel comfortable to, to mention it to the colleague. If that's not an option or that has been done and, and it hasn't resulted in compliance with our policy, certainly if you're familiar with, with the colleague and where they work on campus, sharing this information with their administrator, with their department head or immediate supervisor so it can be addressed because this is a performance expectation of all faculty and staff. Human resources is also there to assist in these matters. If you feel uncomfortable utilizing any of the other approaches, you can certainly share this non-compliance issue with the Office of Human Resources. When we have information regarding the instance, the individual involved, We'll be able to partner with that employee specifically with their next level of administration, make sure that they understand the, the requirements and communicate with them what we expect moving forward. Um, we hope that this truly won't be an issue. We hope that this would be few and far between. We've got great signage on campus, lots of reminders. I think if we work together to remind each other 
And if we're doing what we're supposed to do, that in and of itself is a great reminder to others when they see us with our mask on, when they see us keeping our, our, um, our space from one another, it can help to remind them. So any and all of those opportunities are available. If we do have instances where there's unfortunate continuation of non-compliance, Human Resources is happy to assist with members of administration of handling it formally. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, I actually have a follow-up question from the Q&A for Bob and Tom, if they're available. It's about cleaning supplies. Um, Bob and Tom, are cleaning supplies going to be available in all classrooms on Monday? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Yes, it's Tom. Uh, they have been working this week to install uh, dispensers in the classrooms and we've been uh, distributing disinfectant spray to those classrooms. Uh, we feel like we've got an accurate list and we've hit everywhere, but we, uh, certainly I can't guarantee that. If there's a situation where it's not available, uh, please call the facilities department and, and we'll respond right away to get those delivered. That's uh, extension 4521? Yes. Four, five, two, one. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, now we're going to move on to instruction and technology. So the first question we have is going to be for you, Mary. Mary, how can I prepare my instruction to adapt if a student needs my face-to-face -face course online? Thank you for the question, Susan. Yes, we, um, we've been talking with a lot of faculty over the summer and I prepared just a few suggestions, but I would like to say also that the staff of the Walker Center is available to troubleshoot with you, kind of work through what you, what might come up for you. Um, and we've actually extended our hours um, into the evening uh, through the month of August. So we're available when you're working. Um, if you wanna shoot us an email or give us a call, we'll be happy to talk to you about your specific situation. I saw in the chat, there were a couple of questions. Um, but let me just go through some ideas that we have for you. Uh, one is that we, We've been talking a lot about Kaltura people. Some people still like Zoom and that's fine. These are two all options that we have on campus. Um, you can use Canvas to share the link. Uh, you can also do recordings and share the link so that students who may have missed or weren't able to get online um, can also view those. So we're available to help you set those up, set up your link, um, get you upgraded to pro on Zoom if you need to so you have more time. Um, we also ask that you look at your syllabus now before the semester even starts and just look at your assessments, look at the things that you're gonna be taking up for a grade and plan how would you do that if you had to do it in a digital format. So for example, if you had a project that comes in, um, could you accept it with images online or could you accept it in some other way other than um, face to face? Also, we're thinking that if you will consider allowing the students to turn on their devices, the students that you're meeting with in the class, and let them connect to Zoom also. So if you've got students at home on Zoom and then students in the class on Zoom, it actually could benefit both because then they can engage with each other. And also there would be um, students in the class that could help you keep up with chat if you've ever tried to um, keep up with face-to-face -face and uh, what's going on online, it's good to have somebody there to help you. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, and also think now about how you would rotate the class if necessary. Would you allow the face-to-face -face students to choose their day of the week um, or would you assign which days they're, they're supposed to come? Some of you um, maybe aren't sure exactly how you're going to do that. You might do it alphabetically. Um, contact us if you're not sure how you want to set that up and we can even help you um, do a little survey if you want to ask students which day they prefer. Will there be an opportunity once the class gets started if someone needs to change? Maybe they um, have an easier time getting a ride to come on the Monday class instead of Wednesday, things like that. And also keep in mind throughout the semester that being flexible will be important because you will surely have students who go into quarantine or have to be isolated. And at that point, um, the size of the groups face-to-face -face versus online um, could could one could become bigger than the other. 
I would suggest personally that you plan to include a midterm survey. We can assist you with that. That's a great time to just get a feel for how the uh, experience that your students are having and if there's anything that you could address. Maybe they don't feel comfortable to tell you um, with you know with their name attached but a survey could be anonymous and you could address some of their concerns before the end of the semester when it's kind of too late to make changes. Uh, our assistance um, right now includes extended hours. We have been updating our trainings every week uh, adding things like um, a, specific to Zoom, using Zoom for office hours, using breakout rooms. Um, we will have a new listing for next week. It'll come out today. And then we also have an entire list online of workshops uh, that are available on demand where, where we've recorded workshops that we've done um, on Zoom over the summer. I think I have one more. <laughs> Here's our contact information. Um, our phone is answered uh, and we have a, we have our phones forwarded. Uh, some of us are still working at home. We're kind of on a rotating schedule. We're also going to begin next week limited face-to-face -face, um, uh, consultations in the center it, once the library is fully uh, back open. So we, but we would like to ask you to make an appointment so that we don't end up with too many people in the space um, during the hours that we are going to be uh, taking consultations. So I know you have other questions, but this was just to give you a, just kind of an overview and let you know that we're available. We love hearing your questions. It actually helps us learn more about what what people need so thank you very much for including us today thank you so much Mary we really appreciate that um, we're going to move on to instruction and technology now um, Tony could you talk to us a little bit about what technology is in my classroom to help me deliver my instruction to my students Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you know, it's, this, this is a kind of a, a, an interesting question because each classroom is unique. Um, but in this specific situation to prepare for fall, um, we reached out to academic affairs to identify which spaces um, are going to be utilized for the face-to-face -face, uh, sessions this fall. And we wanted to target those classrooms first. Um, and so the first thing that we did is we are in, finishing up and we should be done by the end of this weekend installing the Sure microphone kits. Now what these microphone kits uh, are there for is to help boost your vocals, especially if you're having to wear a mask or a shield. Um, we have found that this is probably the best tool to be able to help ensure that your students um, can hear you clearly. Um, it is, its primary purpose is to boost vocals. There's some added benefits to uh, using this to, uh, along with another technology I'm gonna discuss here in a bit, the audio equipment, um, but its primary purpose is to simply uh, build, uh, excuse me, boost that, those vocals. Um, I did put a picture there on the right just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. These headsets um, that you would want to check out using the link you'll find at the bottom of that slide, utc.edu slash employee tech request. Um, this headset is to be utilized in the classroom only. There is no other be uh, uh, benefit to using this headset other than in these classrooms. If you find that your classroom on the first day of classes does not have um, this equipment, please let us know as soon as possible. Um, it may be that we didn't get the updated list or there's been a class change that we weren't aware of. Um, we want to make sure that we get one in those spaces if the technology will work in that um, classroom. So again, let us know as soon as you get into those classrooms. We want to make sure that you have access at a minimum to this tool. Um, and you'll want to keep this, um, and I'll, we can stay there. Um, we want to make sure that you have um, a, a, a headset and you'll be able to keep it all semester. So it's not one of those things that you have to drop back off at the library every week. Um, keep it, um, you know, that way you're maintaining it, keeping it clean. Um, and at the end of the semester, you can decide if you need to return it, um, depending on if you have another class the following semester. Um, another thing you may have seen in emails that I've sent over the last couple weeks is introducing a new technology called Vadio Conference Shot. This is kind of a bundle that includes a 10x zoom camera along with some microphones that are sitting in the classrooms. This is not something you have to bring with you. Um, and so what this allows you to do is to kind of um, integrate with the technology um, that Mary mentioned earlier, Kaltura. Um, we have uh, worked with Walker um, to look towards how, or look at how Kaltura and what we call lecture capture hardware, how those two work together. And it's actually really nice. It gives you the ability to walk into a classroom and be able to stream and record um, your lecture. 
And at the same time, you're able to have different presets. Um, for example, you know, on the control panel that sits on the lectern, you have the ability to switch to different presets. So for example, you might be looking, uh, the default is at, at the lectern, you teaching behind there. And then you want to shift to maybe a whiteboard or shift um, the camera to a periodic table or a map that you typically reference on a regular basis. Um, these are things that we can set up per classroom. And so this is kind of a nice feature there for especially not for those only in the classroom, but maybe those that are, are you know, watching in, uh, whether they're maybe quarantined or maybe that they're um, isolated and they don't have the ability to go into the class. This is kind of a nice way to, uh, to provide um, that experience to, to those users as well. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, this works with Kaltura, but not just Kaltura, but Zoom as well. Some people have indicated they, they want to continue to use Zoom. Um, this camera will work along with the microphones with this technology. Um, one other thing I want to add here, um, we, we've already um, installed these in 26 rooms. Um, the 70, uh, we have a total of 74 that we're planning on putting on campus. There was a delay in getting those shipped um, due to supply chain. Um, we are expecting those to be here next week and our folks are ready to start installing those. All the pre-work has been done up to this point and all the classroom um, slated to receive this equipment. And you can check our website for the latest um, listings for both the microphones and the conference shot bundles. All right, thanks Matt, next. All right, for those classrooms that do not have a video conference shot, you can leverage these um, standard webcams. These are the ones that you would pick up from a local retailer. Um, these are ones that we have available um, for those who need it for not just the classroom, but also at home. If you're at home teaching and you wanna be able to stream or record your video and you don't already have a camera built into your uh, laptop or one with your desktop, you can check one of these out as well through um, the technology request form. The link again is at the bottom of this slide. Um, and again, this is good for those who you know, want to be able to still stream or record while they're in the classroom as well. It works just like the um, body equipment with the exception of you don't have that nice little feature that moves between the different presets and the quality is not as good as the body equipment. So something to kind of keep in mind um, if you're looking at uh, loaning this out or getting this from our, our, our check-in request or tech request. Um, and again, with this one, we'll, we'll ask that you keep the webcam if you need it each week. Um, this goes for any of the technology. If you don't think that you're going to use it, just leave it available for someone else to check out. Um, and a lot of this, you may have to wait till you get into your own classroom to really see if you're going to need it or not. So we should have plenty of these available for you as well if you need it to in or outside the classroom. Um, that's it for right now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. If the other piece here, you know, I can answer this after you're ready, Susan. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, <clears throat> Tony, as a side note, for the technology that's in the classroom, um, an additional question is, can you clean the keyboards in the classroom with the cleaner before you use them? Are we, what specific cleaner, what type of cleaner are we talking about? The ones being provided by facilities? Yes. Um, well, it depends on what they're providing. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's suggested not, you know, we're, we're still dealing with liquids, so you definitely don't want to, you know, spray that stuff onto the keyboards or into the computers, of course. Um, doing a light wipe down uh, is, is appropriate for the technology in the various spaces. Um, that's about the most I can speak to the technology. Tony, Tony, I'll, I'll, Susan, I'll jump in on that. Um, what one approach would be to spray uh, the disinfectant onto a soft cloth and then have that gently wipe across the surface. That way you're not putting that liquid directly on the equipment. Right. Thank you, oh, thank you, Bob. That's a great suggestion. Um, the next question, I believe, would be for Tony and for Mary, probably. Um, it's about instruction and, and technology, again. But it's what technology is available for use at home to help me deliver my instruction to my students? Okay. I can at least speak to the technology that's available right now, again, through that same technology request form that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have four things listed here. If you need a laptop for whatever reason, um, if your com you know, computer breaks in the middle of the semester and you need something for teaching, please reach out and put a request in for those. Um, we pretty much have Windows devices and Chrome devices. So uh, again, check that technology request form and indicate your preference and someone will follow up with you in ensuring that uh, we get you exactly what you need. Um, some folks are in a situation when maybe they're, you know, they're being asked to teach um, from home and they don't have internet. Um, that, it's, it's rare, but it does happen. We want to make sure that we get you a Wi-Fi hotspot so that you're able to um, teach while you're at home and have some form of an internet. We do also, we will ask a lot of questions if you indicate that because we want to make sure that this will work in your area. 
Um, I mentioned earlier the webcam, those uh, are beneficial not only in the classroom, but also at home or in your office. And then we have a variety of software that's available to you and you can put a request in um, and indicate the software that you're looking for and we'll look at what we can do to get that to you. Go ahead, Mary. I, I didn't really have anything to add other than um, one thing that people contact our office about sometimes is Camtasia, but that actually comes through Tony also. Um, but if anybody needs help, like figuring out which form to fill out, we, we can help with that too. In addition, if you have questions, please, if it's related to the technology, um, please call our help desk at the, the, the typical 4,000 while you're on campus. Um, and they'll point you in the right direction. If it's related to how to utilize the technology, um, you know, with the different modalities um, out there, um, we definitely would point you to Walker and recommend that you call them there best on how to, to do that piece. Thank you both. Um, now we're gonna move on to classroom prot protocols. Um, Dr. Hale, could you talk to us about what are the protocols for conducting a face-to-face -face class? Sure. and. Uh, the first thing that I want to uh, convey to faculty members who are on the call is that you do have control and you do have some latitude over what you uh, what you direct students to do in your classes. And, and so um, what we'll be talking about here are things that you can uh, include as part of your regular uh, daily classroom protocols. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, you have heard me say, if you've been on any of the, uh, fac the faculty forums that we've had on Thursdays, sometimes uh, also when I have uh, added to the Wednesday forums, that uh, first of all, I'm very grateful for all of the great work that you all did uh, last spring, and we know that you faced some challenges that you hadn't faced before. Um, you would have also heard me say yesterday and, and various other times, You'll also face some challenges that you've not faced before as we move forward with face-to-face -face instruction uh, in, in the fall. There'll be different challenges than the ones that you had in the spring. And what I'd like to do is talk with you about um, you know, four of those uh, very uh, quickly. One of them I won't spend much time on because I think that uh, Bob and Tom did a great job, um, but I'll, I'll review it again just very briefly. The first thing that you're going to want to do that you have probably uh, never done before unless you've been uh, teaching in uh, laboratory sections in uh, natural sciences or, or perhaps in engineering is to plan some time for cleaning your space. And so you should plan uh, some time for cleaning the space where you're teaching. Uh, if you are in the front of the classroom and uh, you know your teaching style uh, better than I will, um, but make sure that you have time before you uh, begin and as you complete your class uh, to clean the space where you're teaching. Uh, the second thing is to ask the students to clean at their seats. And um, what we would like to have happen, if possible, is for students uh, to clean when they arrive at the classroom and to uh, clean again as they are leaving the classroom. What we're hoping to put into place is a double cleaning protocol then where the students who are leaving the classroom have just cleaned the space and by the same token, the students who are entering uh, will do the same thing. So we want uh, to uh, clean on the way in and on the way out. Um, to secure supplies for your room, uh, you heard uh, uh, Bob and Tom say earlier that they have done their very best to make sure that all of the classrooms are equipped with cleaning supplies. If you find out that there are not cleaning supplies in any classroom where, where you are teaching, um, uh, Bob also gave you the telephone number that you can call to let people know. Um, you may also feel free to call the provost's office and we'll try to get in touch um, with the facilities folks to make sure that you have the cleaning supplies that you're going to need uh, for your classroom. Um, a number of those supplies will also be, will also have been delivered to your department. And so that's another possibility for you as well. Um, we recommend that every um, faculty member carry some spare disposable masks uh, with you as you uh, head off to your classes. Um, uh, I can remember my 18 to 22 year olds uh, years 
and uh, having a great memory and remembering everything that I needed to have in any class or any place that I was going was not always a strong suit for me. And I imagine that we will encounter students who will have uh, left a mask back in their car, in their residence hall, in their apartment or wherever they might be living and um, will not be able to go and retrieve it. And so we recommend that um, there are uh, disposable masks that you have with you. There will also be disposable uh, masks at various locations on campus um, so that students will be able to access them if they need to as well. Uh, Matt, can you go to the next slide for me? Thank you very much. Uh, another thing that you've never had to do before is to guide student traffic in and out of uh, the classrooms. And uh, the facilities folks have, have done a great job um, creating some signage that will help with that. Um, but we ask that you control the egress and ingress in your classrooms and that um, students, uh, you and your students, uh, enter the class only after the previous class has left the classroom space. Um, we ask that as students are coming in and out of the classroom, that you do everything that you possibly can to per, put a protocol in place um, so that students are remained appropriately distanced from one another as they're entering and leaving the classroom. And that uh, as much as you can, try to get students to leave the classroom as soon as the class is completed. That last part is gonna run counter to, uh, you know, what a lot of you have been doing throughout your teaching careers. Um, one of the things that, that really makes for a relationship between you and your students is, is uh, probably some informal conversation and, and banter with them that you're used to having either before your classes start or when your classes end. And for public safety reasons at this point in time, um, we would ask that you that you not do that. If you're going to do that, please take up those conversations with them uh, in Zoom, in office hours, online, or outside. And if you do it outside, again, please do it from an appropriately uh, uh, an appropriate social distance. And then the last thing that I was going to mention to you is you will notice when you go into a lot of classrooms that there are markings on the floor. Um, for where the furniture is supposed to be, if the furniture can be, uh, can be rearranged um, and is, is not in a fixed location. Um, you'll notice when you go into a classroom that a number of the desks and chairs have straps around them. The straps are designed to, uh, to keep uh, students from utilizing every piece of furniture that's in the classroom. And so we would ask that you uh, keep uh, the open chairs, the ones without straps, at least six feet apart from one another so that students are appropriately socially distanced in the classroom, um, both from themselves and from you. And uh, please do not uh, um, remove the straps on the furniture and, and please do not have your students remove the straps on the furniture um, you know, what, what we don't want this to be, I, I remember my residence hall days and, um, uh, you know, I never had the appropriate tools, but there were people um, who had all kinds of traffic signs and things like that um, from their, uh, in their residence hall rooms. Um, what we would not like to have happen is the, the straps that are on furniture is to become student trophies um, to be displayed at various uh, places in their living spaces. So please don't let them remove the straps on the furniture and um, notify your department head immediately if there is a room that you have taught in that you think uh, needs attention and uh, they can put in a work order and or a contact um, facilities to, uh, to see if the, the room can get immediate attention. And you heard Bob and Tom talk earlier um, that if there is a room that needs immediate attention, that they will make sure that uh, it is provided. Um, uh, Matt, is there another? Uh, uh, okay, uh, not for me. So anyway, uh, gang, uh, life in uh, this fall will look in a number of ways very different than your previous classroom settings, but you have the control over your classroom setting to make sure that you can keep it safe for yourself and your students. And um, the, the 
university codes of conduct, the student code of conduct, um, gives you the prerogative to, to direct student behavior in your classroom in order to uh, keep your classroom safe and to keep the classroom environment uh, one that students can learn in. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. Um, our next set of questions will be about the life of academic programs. Matt, could you talk to us about how we will continue the life of our academic programs through this semester? Thank you, Susan. Uh, we have been thinking about how folks are going to continue to do the normal academic business that's not instruction. And uh, we know that there are several processes that we will have to keep up with this fall. And unlike in the spring, when we had to shift to an online format for a lot of things, there are some processes we haven't had to do a lot of online before. Uh, for example, department meetings, you probably held a few of those in the spring, maybe over the summer, maybe you've held some this week. But uh, we'd like to encourage you to continue to hold your meetings virtually. So uh, especially if you have a large department, finding a suitable space for a large department to meet is going to be a challenge. And you may have faculty who have, or staff, who have work from home agreements. And in order to include everyone, you will need to provide a virtual option. Even if some people are meeting face-to-face, -face, others will need the opportunity to meet in a virtual way. Uh, you may have an opportunity for small groups to meet, and there are appropriate reasons for that if you have a small committee doing the work of a department. But uh, when you do that, make sure that you are communicating as much as possible about these kinds of meetings. So more than ever, because we're apart and we're not as likely to encounter each other in a hallway uh, or to see that meetings are going on, make sure that you are working in a public and clear way with everyone. So if there's a meeting of the full department, you need to make sure that everyone is included. If there is a meeting of the RTP committee or an important committee, like the curriculum committee in your department, make sure that you are clear about communication and that everyone that gets that needs that communication receives it. Uh, again, it's not as easy as just walking down the hall to grab someone who needs to be in a meeting as it was before. We have gotten some questions about uh, whether reappointment, tenure and promotion and our post-tenure review processes are gonna continue for the fall. The answer is yes. All of the existing calendars for those will remain in place. Uh, in fact, we have already reached out to UT System to see if there would be any changes to their timeline for getting tenure and promotion materials to them in the spring. We haven't heard back from them, but we do know that they still expect roughly the same timeline that we had this past year. So that means we will need to be following our calendar. That does mean that you need to plan ahead for things that uh, you've done in the past. Reappointment, tenure, and promotion cases will require a lot of planning ahead, especially because external reviews, for example, are now required uh, for tenure and for promotion. That means that uh, what might have been a quick meeting of your RTP committee in the past uh, may now be a much longer process that extends over more than one meeting, depending on how long it takes to work out details. So plan ahead and I don't encourage you to uh, ex expect that a single meeting will solve all of your cases. There are some processes in our faculty handbook that require anonymous voting. It's not optional, it is a requirement. For example, tenure requires an anonymous vote. Promotion does not. Uh, reappointment for uh, the third year review for faculty on the tenure, uh, tenure track, that actually requires an anonymous vote as well. We don't have uh, guidance from system, although we have been assured we will receive some on the appropriate way to handle anonymous voting. And we will be in touch with you before those RTP processes have to go forward uh, to let you know what our recommendation is on how to conduct anonymous voting. Uh, some of your programs depend a great deal on student recruitment. So you may have in the past uh, put out a table uh, in a place where students are likely to be walking to the UC or to classes and tried to recruit students. You may have done it during a welcome 
week event. Uh, that still is an option to you. You just need to be aware that there's probably going to be a lot less foot traffic on campus than there has been in the past. So you may need to consider some new ways to attract students to your program, including some ways to reach out to them in virtual uh, modalities that obviously won't be as attractive for some programs, but uh, given the limitations we have for this fall, uh, it's difficult to see uh, any other option except to expand the way you may be doing recruitment. So again, face-to-face -face recruitment is still an option, but uh, you will need to follow the usual protocols for wearing masks, staying distant, and consider some other ways to expand. For student activities, many of you have activities in your department, you have clubs or you have uh, honor societies. Please, if you're doing that, consider holding your usual events outdoors if possible. The new policy that uh, came out has some information on how to conduct events outdoors and spaces where you can conduct those events. I would encourage you to consider after hours events. If you have to have a room, there will be more space in our larger rooms after hours because we've used a lot of our large spaces uh, that are for instruction during the normal school day. Uh, and finally, you will need to think about how to include online students if possible. Just like students may not be able to attend your classes in person, they won't, that some of them may not be able to uh, attend your uh, student events because they are in quarantine or they are in isolation or they are staying off campus to care for someone. And you should think about how can I reach those students so that they don't become disconnected from my program. Uh, Jerry, that was everything that I had for this. Matt, uh, I, 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 hate, I hate to blindside you with one and it is not unique to face-to-face uh, to -face instruction, which was largely, uh, or, or conducting of departmental business which was largely the purpose of what we were doing. But when you discussed um, reappointment, tenure, and promotion, um, would you mind taking uh, just a couple of minutes because I know you're familiar with the, uh, the Board of Trustees uh, change and uh, the policy with regard to extensions of uh, the tenure clock. Can you address that in case it is of concern to any of the faculty members uh, who are on the call with us? Of course. So the Board of Trustees voted in March to provide extensions to all tenure track faculty who were not already in their sixth year. So that includes people who are in their second year now. And we have uh, launched our uh, form for uh, faculty to solicit, to ask for such an extension after August 1st, so that uh, it was clear that we were including everyone, including brand new appointments. So anyone who is on the, on the tenure track, including people who are in their sixth year this year and normally would be applying for tenure, can apply for an extension. Uh, we've launched a form. Uh, if you don't have that communication, please send me an email. I can uh, direct you to the form. And uh, that form just requires you to request the extension. There is no justification required. Uh, and every faculty member who requests an extension and is eligible for it will receive one. That is the board policy on it. Uh, it does not require a justification by the faculty member or any administrator. Uh, the extension can be for one year or two years. Uh, that is up to the chancellor. The chancellor is the one who makes those decisions, but our process here at UTC involves a recommendation from the, each of the administrators in the line of review. So a department head, a dean, and the provost will have an opportunity to provide a recommendation. And uh, because the question has come up several times, if you request an extension, but your work goes very well and you wish to apply for tenure and promotion in your sixth year, uh, the extension does not mean that applying in the sixth year counts as early, it counts as on time, and there is precedent for this that comes even before our current extension process in which someone was granted an extension, applied in the sixth year, and was considered on time. So this is not a special dispensation just for the pandemic. Jerry, does that answer the question sufficiently?
It does, Matt. My my mute button was running amok on me, and uh, sorry. It took right. I was going to hand it off to you to finish us up for the day. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is to uh, thank all the panelists for uh, uh, graciously giving of their time today. This is a very busy time for all of you uh, on, on campus as we are still uh, finishing up some things before uh, classes begin uh, Monday morning. And I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank the faculty members who are on the call with us uh, as well. Um, you have done extraordinary work for the university throughout your careers, uh, never more extraordinary in my estimation than the work that you did last spring. Um, we are uh, asking you to engage in some more extraordinary uh, teaching and to really do everything that you can to maintain the engaged learning atmospheres that you have created, even though you're, you're uh, going to be doing it in, in very, very different uh, ways. Um, so we will be posting copies of these uh, slides uh, so that you can have access uh, to them, and we'll be doing that very shortly. Um, it is the case that uh, some of the questions that were posed uh, in the Q&A uh, function have been answered throughout the, the course of this meeting. Um, for some of those and for the ones um, that we have not gotten to or that we thought needed longer responses, um, just as we have done for the uh, webinars with students and parents that uh, Susan Lazenby and I have uh, been on, as well as some of the other panelists uh, over the last uh, month and a half or so. Um, we will also be trying to, uh, to respond to those questions and to get the answers um, posted in to inform you of where you can find the answers to those questions, and we'll be doing that for you very shortly as well. So I want to want to thank you for your commitment to the university, and most of all, thank you for your commitment to our students and the ongoing quality of their education. Um, thanks, and um, have a great weekend.